This episode of the podcast is sponsored by Teamistry, a podcast that tells the stories of teams who work together in new and unexpected ways to achieve remarkable things. Each episode tells a unique story and provides practical lessons for your team and your business. I actually got a sneak peek of season two and was immediately sucked in with the fascinating stories, beautiful editing, and practical tips that I was able to apply to my business. Search for Tea Mystery anywhere you listen to podcasts. We will include a link in the show notes and my thanks to Tea Mystery for their support. A lot of times I think CEOs can be kind of mysterious. They don't really know who the person is and they haven't had a chance to meet them and and they kind of hear about them. I'm very upfront with, I'm human, I am a mom, I am, you know, part of this community as well. And we're all working together towards the same mission. So we, uh, I'm here to find out from you what I can do to make work at BayFed easy and interesting and a career for you. That is Carrie Burkhofer, president and CEO of Bay Federal Credit Union, a nonprofit financial cooperative with 225 employees. Carrie was actually one of the CEOs I interviewed for my book, The Future Leader. She's been the CEO there for 25 years, and under her leadership, the credit union has grown from 70 million to 1.4 billion in assets. Carrie truly exemplifies servant leadership. She understands that it is the leader who serves the employees and not the other way around. In our conversation today, Carrie shares a lot of great examples of how she is able to be vulnerable and transparent with her team. And you will hear her unique way of making Bay Federal team members feel welcome from day one. I was also able to ask Carrie what it's been like to lead during COVID, how her team adapted to a mostly virtual setting, how she's kept their culture alive in these turbulent times, and what she's done to stay grounded when things get tough. I brag about my team right now because we've worked really hard to get to this point where we're at, but everyone's singing off the same song sheet. Everyone gets along. It doesn't mean that we all say yes to each other. There's a lot of differing opinions, but there's a lot of respect and kindness that showed towards each other and care about each other. And because of that synergy, it we, we pulled it off and we got everyone working from home and now, and then we set up, we had Zoom licenses, but we expanded them. and. We're very agile and we knew that already about ourselves, but we really proved it um, in that time frame. The world is changing quickly. What do you need to know and do in order to be successful now and in the future? From leadership to the future of work to employee experience, this show will give you the insights and the tools you need to succeed and thrive professionally and personally. Make sure to follow me on Spotify or subscribe to the show on your favorite platform. You can do so easily by going to futureofworkpodcast.com. Also, please rate the podcast on Apple Podcasts or whatever your preferred platform is. It really helps spread the word about the show and I personally appreciate it. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of The Future of Work with Jacob Morgan. My guest today is Carrie Burkhofer. She's the president and CEO at Bay Federal Credit Union, and she's one of the CEOs that I had the opportunity to interview for my book, The Future Leader. So Carrie, thank you for joining me. Thank you for inviting me, Jacob. Well, first I have to say thank you for agreeing to be a part of the book, uh, because I don't know if you know this or not, but whenever I give talks on The Future Leader, I actually have a quote of yours that I use in all my presentations. I don't know if I actually ever told you that before. I don't think I did know that. Yeah, so thousands of people around the world are now familiar with with Carrie and her quote. Um, (laughs) And the quote that you gave me, the one that I use, it was for one of the mindsets that I talked about, the mindset of the servant. And I don't know if you even remember this quote, but um, you basically said that you serve your employees on day one, hour one, when they show up at your company, and you let them know that you are there to serve them and not the other way around, that they are there to serve you. And I love that quote so much that I use that in a lot of my presentations. And um, I get a lot of people who come up to me afterwards and they're like, that's that's a great quote. Who, you know, where's Carrie from? Oh, that's very nice. Yes, I I forgot. I never even told you about that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Well, why don't we get started with a little bit of background information just about you. Uh, Even before you got involved with uh, the credit union, just we're... Where did you grow up? How were you raised? How did you even get involved with what you're doing now? 
Well, I am have been the CEO at Bay Federal Credit Union for like 25 years now. So if I, I don't feel old, but I've been there a long time. I've had a lot of experience, um, started very young as a CEO. Before that, I was the CFO and joined the credit union um, when I was in my 20s. And I was fortunate enough to become a CFO pretty quickly. Before that, I worked for a CPA firm that only audited credit unions. So I had six years of going to a lot of different credit unions. It was a very specialized firm, and I had a chance to work with the management teams and the board of directors right out of college um, and have basically kind of like an um, MBA experience, but at work, where I got to go in and study a lot of different work models and see what was working, what wasn't working. And oftentimes, when I came out of that, I found that the culture of the organization kind of influenced the financial results. And I hadn't studied some of it. I, Harvard Business School has studied it. They call it the service profit chain. But I had a chance to witness it and kind of formulate the same conclusion myself at a pretty young, influential age in my career. So when I ended up moving to a credit union and moving away from the CPA firm, I had a chance to take that wealth of knowledge I had from the finance side, as well as from the culture side, and go into an organization and uh, was given a lot of opportunity to set the tone and be part of the conversation early on. And then after I was there for six years, the CEO left and the board of directors noticed me and they said, would you like to step into the role of CEO? And um, it was a tremendous opportunity and I've been there for 25 years and we've grown the credit union. I think when I became CEO, we were just about a hundred million and this year we're gonna hit 1.4 billion in assets. So we've wow. grown quite a bit. Yeah, that's bit, crazy. Yeah. And it's, um, yeah, I mean, that's 1.4 billion. I remember even when I first spoke with you, it was a billion. So it's, it's grown by 400 million in, uh, in a very short time period. Congratulations. Thank you. So you've been uh, obviously there for a while. And fun fact, so I went to school at UC Santa Cruz. And oh. you, yeah, you guys, I can't believe I didn't tell you all these things. And you guys are, <laughs> you guys are in Capitola, right? Or right about there? Yeah, well, that's where our headquarters is, but we serve all of Santa Cruz County and Monterey County and a small county, San Benito County. So, yes, and we one, our roots is in education. So early on, we started in 1957, and when the campus opened in the 60s, uh, immediately they were brought into the credit union um, network. So we've been part of the university there for a long time. For people who are not familiar with what a credit union is or does, can you give a little, uh, little bit of background information there? And then also about, about your company. How many employees do you guys have? I know you mentioned $1.4 in assets, but if there's anything else that you want to mention about, uh, about you guys, please do so. Sure. Yeah. Credit unions um, are often either people know them and they love them or they're confused by them a little bit, um, primarily because the name union in there. Um, but what a credit union is, is we started in the Depression time, like the 1930s, uh, where people came together to help each each other. So it's a nonprofit financial cooperative of like people um, that come together to help them help each other save money and lend money to each other. So it, we um, bring people in, like in our community, it's a community based credit union. So anyone who lives, works, worships, goes to school, there's criteria at, that in our counties that we serve can join the credit union. And our primary goal is there to serve the needs of our local community. So we bring in deposits and we lend the money back out. We have all the same services as a, as a traditional financial institution. Um, but oftentimes, because we don't have a separate group of stockholders, um, we focus on returning the profits back to the membership. So we usually have better loan rates, better deposit rates, uh, lower fees, and all of the service is focused on serving the customer. Um, so it's a it's a cool model. The board of directors are just volunteers from the membership. And at our credit union, uh, we have about 225 employees and seven branches and ATMs all around the county. And we have our online banking, um, which you can primarily you can join the credit union at any point in your life and stay with the credit union, because just like any bank, you can take your digital banking with you now. So the world's changed a lot regarding the limitations uh, geographically. Very cool. And how many employees do you guys have now? We have 225 employees. Wow. So you guys have even grown employee-wise uh, since the last time we spoke. <laughs> Everything's Yeah, we, it's been growing quite a bit. Uh, I think people really kind of, especially during times like this last year, 
people seek out uh, a place where they feel like they have comfort and vo a voice and they want to uh, be heard by their financial institution if they're having challenges. So we've really proven that to our membership this year. Yeah, oh, very cool, congratulations. Um, so what does a typical day look like for you? So, you know, you're, you're the CEO and I know that now it's, you know, not not a typical day thanks to COVID and all the madness that's going on out there. Um, so maybe we can do a little comparison, like what did a typical day look like for you before COVID? And what does a typical day look like for you now as we're in COVID? Oh, yeah, it's, it's completely changed. Um, I used to be much more external and I would be focused on going to community events, um, working in the business world, like creating, you know, business relationships, um, being out into the credit union world and going to a lot of uh, conferences and, and learning new ideas, but you do it physically at the place. So it, it takes you out of the office. And um, now it's basically I live and work and sleep in my bedroom. <laughs> I've been like, <laughs> I, I don't leave my bedroom except for like four hours a day, which is crazy. It's such a difference. Um, I miss going into the office uh, and we're being careful and, and have it. All the branches are open, but the back office is primarily working from home still. And um, so my life is very different and I'm much more involved in day-to-day -day operations, not to influence the direction uh, as far as like, you know, tactical operations, but I'm much more involved in communication with all employees and with the board of directors and the senior leadership team. Um, it's just dramatically changed. Yeah, no, I can imagine. Uh, well, if we were to look at uh, before COVID, I mean, how maybe you can walk us through even when you wake up, like what, what does your actual day look like? Because a lot of people are just fascinated. How does a CEO spend their time? Uh, do you have any habits or rituals that you practice on a regular basis? Are you very structured? Do you have a routine? Uh, mm -hmm. So if you can walk us through maybe like when you get up until the work day ends. Sure. Well, um, I get up actually before I even wake up lately, I've been waking up in the middle of the night. So I, I try not to stress about it. And I, uh, I do whatever's bothering me. I get on my phone. I might even look at email. I look at the news and then I try to fall back asleep for a few hours. So I've been waking up like at 3.30 in the morning and then being awake till like five and then going back to sleep till, um, till like 6.30 or seven sometimes. So then I do get up, I, got, I have a brand new puppy. So he gets me out of bed every morning. I have my college age daughter also here. So she's on Zoom doing school. And we uh, then I, I go for a walk every morning. I'm fortunate, I live a couple blocks from the ocean. Oh, so I'm part of my- I know I, Capitola yeah, but, in, in that area, it's beautiful. Yeah, and I'm closer to the campus. So I'm right off West Cliff. So I'm right on the lower west side of Santa Cruz. So I walk down to the cliffs every morning and I, I, have, I look at the Monterey Bay, which is just beautiful. And I do, I have a whole gratitude, um, thankfulness kind of mantra that I go through. And it actually started 10 years ago when I was going through the recession and we went through some challenging times back then. And it was a way to keep me centered and I've continued it for 10 years. So it's really come in helpful during this time as well. Interesting. And well, then, um, so before before you even go on, are you, are you able to share? Uh, I mean, you know, you don't. If it's private, you don't need to share anything. But um, anything that you can share about that, because I, I found that actually a lot of executives that I've talked to have some sort of a practice like that, where they go through either their gratitude, their gratitudes, or, or they they journal, or they think about mm -hmm. you know positive things that they have going on, and that's a really really effective way to start their day. So what what does that look like for you? I mean, you walk down there and you just think of like three to five things you're grateful for? Well, for me, what I do is, um, might be kind of unusual, but I have um, about five family members, including my mom, who passed away. And my mom was most recent, like a year ago. Oh, I'm sorry And I to actually, hear. thank you. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And I, I stand and actually... Think, and they're they were all older than me for the most part. And I think of the wisdom that they had, and I, I ask them just for guidance. I really believe that they're still watching over me. And so I, I, I just say a little gratitude. I say a little prayer. I thank God for like my life. I get perspective. Um, mm. And the birds, I, there's a lot of seagulls around. They give me perspective too because whether and I go like this is a commitment I have to myself. I go rain or shine 
hurricane, tornado, we don't have those here, but I go no matter what the weather is. So every, I every do day. the same thing every single day. Yes, it's I have to start my day doing it. Um, and it, I love it. it. It's become not a chore at all. It's it's really grounding for me. Hmm. I stand in the same spot. And if someone's standing there, I wait till they leave and hopefully they go. <laughs> but um, and I and I really, you know, I kind of look up and I think, all of those that are in heaven and I ask for their guidance. I look down, I see the birds flying there and I see that it's nature and everything, everything's normal kind of in nature. I mean, we know, we know there's problems in nature, but like I see a lot of normalcy the birds are still flying around and it really gives me a sense of peace and perspective. And I've been doing a lot of like Zen Buddhist kind of understanding of that, that you only have this moment. And so I really do a lot of deep breathing and just be in the moment. And uh, whatever worries I had in the middle of the night when I woke up or whatever's going on in my life, I, I try to let it go. And I have this mantra that recently came to me, and it's breathe deep and trust. And um, that's been really working. So whenever something feels overwhelming, I start doing my deep breathing, and I just trust the process. And, you know, of course, we're all like planning and taking action and doing the things that we think we need to do. But sometimes you just need to breathe and trust. Yeah, no, and I love that. So, I, so that's fantastic uh, way to start the day uh, okay so you, you go do that and then then what's next and then i get my coffee i love my coffee and i come up to my office and i do something at night <laughs> that um because I, I never thought i'd work in my bedroom my med- bedroom is kind of like you know your sacred place and so i put a blanket over my computer and my big screen and so I kind of block it. So at night, I don't see it. I just see this big quilted blanket that my mother made, actually. <laughs> um, and, and then I take it off and I, I start at my computer. And I, and I actually really love my little workstation I've set up here. I put uh, pictures of my three kids on it. Uh, my, my assistant and I were talking about this the other day because we have a daily Zoom meeting. And we decided to do show and tell from our desk of what we have in front of us because we don't really we don't get to see each other and what's at our desk. And it was really funny, the different things that she had and what I have sitting on our desk um, that we kind of play with or, you know, that are just there every day. So I've, I've made a nice little work zone. And um, and then I go on to my calendar and my calendar rules my life. I have um, like you talked about in the beginning with uh, the quote that I have on the first Monday of every month, I greet the new employees at 830 in the morning. And that's when we do our orientation. And I do it over Zoom now. It's the same format I did before, but it's their first moment of being at work at Bay Federal. And I'm there to um, listen to who they are and then get to share a little about who I am and um, tell about our philosophies at the credit union. And so every day is different, but I have basically Zoom meetings and um, activities that I need to do from 8.30 in the morning till like 4.30 at night, and I'm trying to end at 4.30 because I also do an afternoon walk, and I love the summertime because I could do it at like 7.30 or 8, and it was still light out. But now that it's dark at 4.30 or 5, I'm trying to end my day and um, go outside again and do the same walk I do. And then it uh, this time it's a little different. On the In the morning, I'll bring a cup of coffee, and for a while, I haven't been doing it as much lately, but for a while I brought like a glass of wine or a cocktail on my evening walk just to like, because everything was so crazy. I was like, I, I don't know how everyone's doing this without alcohol. <laughs> but I, I've kind of broken that habit. Now I'm just doing that on Friday and Saturday night and just uh, enjoying, I'm breathing deep the rest of the week. <laughs> but uh, those, those are some things I do. And then during the day, it's all sorts of meetings. I still belong to my Rotary Club. So I go Monday afternoons to Rotary and um, I meet daily now with my executive assistant on zoom i meet daily with my executive team which is my two executive vice presidents and then twice a week i meet with my senior leadership team and we never had that kind of structure before i was out of the office a lot more and um we had good communication but we're have much better communication now and one last thing that i do that um started probably about april is the employees, everyone, I think, went through their freak out of like, what is, how are we doing this COVID thing? And we're all working apart. And I started writing a Friday morning email to all employees, kind of giving an update of what was accomplished during that week and, and kind of a little bit of my uh, centeredness that I try to maintain and share it with them. We went through 
uh, we're still going through like, you know, a lot of racial tensions and uh, we went through uh, fires here in Santa Cruz County. We yeah. lost 900 homes wow. in September and October. And so we've been through a lot. And so every Friday morning, I write a Friday email to the employees and try and lift their spirits as well as keep them informed. And I I tried to wean myself from it a little because it's a lot of work. It's half of my Friday. I put that together. But I've gotten feedback that employees really appreciate that connection. And so I'm actually more connected to the employees now than I was before COVID as well with this voice that I have every Friday that I deliver to them. Wow, that's awesome. I mean, I, I love, um, I mean, you, you spend a lot of time, it seems like uh, nature, the outdoors for you as a leader really help kind of center you and, and make you better at, at what you do. And I feel very much the same way. I mean, my, my wife and I, we take uh, walks and spend time outdoors whenever we can as well. Um, I wanted to touch on something that you said, which was the the first day for your employees. And I thought maybe we could talk a little bit more about what that looks like. Why is that so important that you are there on day one um, setting that experience for them? And can you also share a little bit more about what happens on day one? Like, what do you do? What do you talk about? Um, do people ask sure. you questions? Yeah, they. a lot of times I try to get them to talk to me, but they, I think, feel a little intimidated. But that's okay, because I have a follow-up to that, which I'll share. But we, um, so it starts with the training and the human resources team. So there's like four or five employees besides me. And um, we have them either come on Zoom or physically. We have a training room where they can sit apart and some of my team are in there. And they would, and my team goes around and ex- shares who they are, um, what their path has been at the credit union, kind of showing that there's career opportunities and also something interesting that they want to share, either that something that maybe they did that weekend or something that's going on in their life. And it's always fun to hear what the, those are. And then, and then we have the employees, the new ones, give their same information, who they are, where they've come from, uh, something interesting that they want to share. And then I go last because I, I don't want to influence the process. They don't really know who I am, I don't think, unless they've studied the credit union. So I then introduce myself. And um, I also share, you know, my journey, where I've been, something interesting about me. But then I also share um, kind of our manage our values and our management philosophy and um, our commitment to culture um, and how important that is to us. And I, I share with them also that it's really important that they understand that their role is to be a team player, that we've chosen them because we see something in them that shows that they uh, have a good connection with people because that's important in our business. And uh, that it's not easy always to get hired at Bay Federal because we screen for that. And so I, I share appreciation to them, you know, and that it's great that they're here, like try and make them feel really excited about it. And, and also that as a CEO that I do want to hear what they have to say, that they are valued as a person um, that we listen and we care about them, that they have a voice that it's, it's, I think it's important for a person to feel seen and heard. And so for a CEO to come in and say that to them on their first day, when it might be their first job at 19 years old as a teller, I, I see them light up, you know, and I mentioned to them the culture and how it's different. Like in some retail organizations, you might walk in and you could tell employees are not engaged and immediately you might turn around and walk out because you just don't get the vibe of, being welcomed. And I said, we, we want you to feel welcomed and we want you to welcome people when they come in. So I'm demonstrating that to them without kind of actually saying that, but that's the importance of it is that we want to walk our talk. And you see, so then, Oh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. And then, um, and then I follow up with them because then I ask them if they have any questions and they're, they're a little intimidated. I could tell it's your first day. And I recognize that. And I say, you know, don't worry about it. Gather your questions. If you have any, let me know. And then what my executive team and I do, I've got two executive vice presidents. We take, and I tell them this, that you'll have a chance to ask us questions when you've been here for a little while. About a month or two later, we take them to lunch and we used to do it physically. Now we do it over Zoom and uh, we order them uh, DoorDash so they can order their lunch and we check in with them and we ask them, how is it going? You know, you heard me speak on that first morning when you came in 
um, and you've had a chance to be here for a couple of months, how are you doing? What questions do you have now? And then the conversation's much different. Now they feel excited to be part of the team, they're acclimated, and they have a lot of questions that we have a great conversation with them. Very cool. I like that you uh, get DoorDash for everybody so you guys can still have lunch together. Uh, so you mentioned that you actually see employees light up. So you think it does make a difference that they get to see you on day one, they know that you're there. And how do you communicate this idea that you are there to serve them and not they are there to, to serve you? Well, I, I talk about how we are a team and it's important that they feel part of the team. And I tell them that I'm there too, to be part of the team that, you know, I, a lot of times I think CEOs can be kind of mysterious. They don't really know who the person is and they haven't had a chance to meet them and, and they kind of hear about them. And I, I want to, I'm very upfront with, I'm human. I am a mom. I am, you know, part of this community as well. And we're all working together towards the same mission. So we, uh, I'm here to find out from you what I can do to make work at BayFed easy and interesting and a career for you. And so please share with me what that looks like from your point of view, because I think it's important for executives to hear that from all levels of how we can make um, the organization um, easy to be at. You want people to stay and work for you. And so I'm trying really hard to open those communication lines up. You know, I think every company has some politics and things that don't go well. I think it's really important that uh, you continue to work with your management team so that they have the same level of um, engagement and appreciation for other people and natural curiosity that I tend to have. Um, so it, it, I can come in and say that, but it's also really important that the management team leads with that as well. So that's one of the challenges that you face in an organization that we continue to face is making sure that the management team is engaging at the same level. Because I'm obviously I'm not there every day, yeah. but um, but those are some of the things that we do to um, make it feel like, and and we don't want it to be um, an entitled culture where they are like, well, let me tell you what I want, and this is how I, you know, I want you to deliver it to me. I mean, we make it really clear that we also look for performance and. Um, it's important that you deliver on that. And we're going to be transparent and pointing things out and we want you to learn and grow. And, uh, but we're not afraid to say you're not a culture fit if you come in and you don't, you don't mesh well with others. Yeah. Um, and I say that up front too, you know, I, I want to be honest, you know, sometimes people join us and it's not the right fit. And it's important that they hear that because we want them to be successful and it just might not be here with us. Yep. No, couldn't agree more. Uh, I wanted to get back to something you mentioned earlier, and you said that uh, what we've been experiencing with COVID has actually brought your team closer together. So before COVID, would all of you be working out of a physical location? All Well, you, you have a headquarters in Capitola, and how many how many employees are out of that one? Well, we have um, we have two offices that are in the Santa Cruz County area, and the senior leadership team was kind of split between the two. So to be physically together, we would have to move over to the other, you know, someone who had to come over to another building. Okay. And then, and something that's happened since COVID is that we've recognized the power of working remotely. And we're, we've now hired um, one executive at, that is no longer, that doesn't live in our area. And we had one executive move away and we don't have a problem with that. So we're now able to meet remotely and just be just as effective. I think it's actually more effective than we were face to face. There is some things that you lose when you're not face to face, the casual conversations in yeah. the hallway. And I think we miss those and, and we're going to make some concerted efforts when we come back into the office where we're going to have maybe a week, a month where everyone is in town. Um, we, we're trying to sort through that, uh, but we're going through this transformation where we, we're going to allow working remotely and we're, rec we're recruiting remotely as well. Very cool. So how, how did you guys adapt? Because I would imagine most people used to be in an office and then, you know, COVID came about and how did you implement the virtual work environment? Did you guys already have the tools and technologies or was it was it a gradual 
change or was it a, a sudden, you know, freaking out? You guys didn't have the right infrastructure in place. How'd you guys make that work? Well, on March 13th, the governor kind of hinted that we were shutting down. And on March 17th, everyone went home and we ha- adapted that day. Um, it took about a week for the technology team to get 100 employees situated at home. And I know companies much larger have done this as well. It was it was kind of a miracle in the business world <laughs> that we all did it. But um, it happened really quickly. It happened overnight. If you had told me six months ago, a month ago, that, that this is something that we will have to do and uh, this is how we're going to operate and you're going to do it less than a week, my team would have laughed at me. Um, but we did it. And we just, I, I think it shows the power of, Uh, having a clear mandate. That's an important thing. If you have clear, crystal clear direction, I think teams can do amazing work. And it also showed me the power of a team that is very synergized and works collaboratively together. And um, I brag about my team right now because we've worked really hard to get to this point where we're at, but everyone's singing off the same song sheet. Everyone gets along. It doesn't mean that we all say yes to each other. There's a lot of differing opinions, but there's a lot of respect and kindness that showed towards each other and care about each other. And because of that synergy, it we we pulled it off and we got everyone working from home. And now, and then we set up, we had Zoom licenses, but we expanded them and um, we were, were very agile. And we knew that already about ourselves, but we really proved it um, in that time frame. And And at the same time as we were doing that, we introduced a lot of new loan ish- services to help people with their issues. Like we gave um, we gave people deferrals on their loan payments, and we had to set up the systems to do that. We didn't have them all set up, and it was across the board from consumer loans to mortgage loans, working with federal agencies. Um, we did an amazing amount of work in a very short period of time. Very cool. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's been really amazing to see how quickly organizations have been able to adapt and get up to speed in just a few short days. Um, So how has the ways in which you guys work changed? Because as you mentioned, you don't have that casual pop in anymore. Hey, how's it going? You gotta like, uh, you know, schedule things in advance. But do you feel that having a virtual team has actually brought you guys closer together? I think it's allowed us to have better communication. Um, We definitely are, talking more frequently in the beginning we talked daily so we had 12 of us that are senior leadership team members meeting every day for a half an hour and it was really important because we had so many moving parts and so many things happening and we weaned ourselves off to like once a week maybe sometimes twice a week um, and we have uh, created kind of the rules of the road as you call it uh, where we are initially made decisions on the fly in these meetings and then I would sleep on it and I would I would reverse it in the morning like oh my gosh we made that decision too quickly and it felt a little chaotic so we've put in mechanisms where um, people are bringing forward thoughtful proposals in writing gives us a day to look at it before we make a decision on it and it's made things a lot better Um, but we've just kind of learned along the way so our team has continued to grow and learn as a team in this process as far as like personal connection, it's been harder. I think um, we we had a few instances where people were all in town at the same time, and we met outside at lunch. Um, and we have a couple of barbecues in the back of one of our offices, and we barbecued and had potluck, and it felt safe. We kept our distance, kept our masks on, but we had lunch together, and in the and. We organized the fun a little bit. Like my assistant did a trivia game, and she had prizes, and it just it was good just to get together and laugh and just like relax like it used to be. And um, so we're trying to do that also over Zoom. We have a fun activity we're doing in December um, with employees and also as a team and trying to keep some of our traditions alive just a little bit differently. Yeah, very cool. So um, I like that you're translating uh, <laughs> some of the physical stuff to the virtual, uh, which I think is is also very, very important um, for a lot of organizations to do. But it's great that you've been able to maintain that that communication in a virtual world. If you're enjoying this episode, please remember to check out our sponsor, Teamistry. Season two of their podcast is out now and is hosted by award-winning documentary filmmaker, Gabriella Copperthwaite, the director of Blackfish, 
It's a fascinating show filled with great insights and stories. Check it out by searching for Tea Mystery anywhere you listen to podcasts. We will also include a link in the show notes. And thanks again to Tea Mystery for their support. What about as far as corporate culture goes? Uh, how do you maintain and, and sustain that corporate culture that you've created um, when it's not in person anymore and everything is virtual? Has, has that been a challenge? It's been a challenge, but I think it's been a fun challenge um, because we have a very strong culture. We have a lot of um, things that we do that are our traditions, and we've had to change a lot of them, but we're still keeping them going. So one of them is uh, Halloween has always been a big one for the credit union. We have an amazing team that like we took, we, we've taken it over the top where every department has a theme and they completely transform their branch or their back office to the theme and with props and everything. And, and it's literally the senior leadership team goes around to every location. It's a whole day of just touring around and members come in knowing it. We've had the news come in. I mean, it, it's quite a production. Um, this year it was on a Saturday, which kind of gave us a little bit of break on it um, because we weren't working Saturday and we, we did it where uh, we had instead that whole week was spirit week. And it was kind of like high school spirit week where every day is a different theme, like pajama day or whatever. So we, and we have an intranet that is, uh, makes it really easy to upload photos. So everyone can participate and share their picture. And then we have uh, voting of the pictures and then prizes given out for best photos and best spirit. And so we've just changed it. And one of the ways that we've done that is we have a committee that uh, is now called the virtual fun committee. And they organize a lot of these activities to keep things going. Um, and so it's just, it's about using creativity and finding ways to engage with each other. Um, it really, one of our key success factors is a thoughtfully designed culture. And um, we continue to be that way. We are purposeful, we're values-based, we, and we're just changing the way you do it. And actually I'm finding it has added a lot of variety and interesting, fun ideas that amuse me that make it fun to see what's going to happen next. I mean, it's it. there's never a dull moment, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, keep it exciting. I love the Halloween um, uh, going crazy on that holiday. That's one of my favorites as well. Uh, what about as far as leading? <clears throat> because obviously when you're leading people in person and you're leading them you know, through a camera, through a screen, it's 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 different. Uh, so how do you make sure that you can still lead effectively, communicate effectively in a world where you're not seeing anybody face to face? Uh, have you had to change the way that you lead or change your approach at all? I personally, um, this might sound kind of funny, but I personally kind of like this approach. I don't find seeing people on the camera that much different than seeing face to face. And one thing my team will laugh at this because they know this about me, is that I was on the edge of getting hearing aids because I grew up in the 70s, listened to loud music, and I would be in a boardroom meeting where the half the team was clear across the board table, and I would miss a lot of the conversation. Like I was realizing like I was going to move my seat or get hearing aids because there was just a lot going on. And now that we're all in these little squares and I've got my, um, my you know, AirPods on, I can hear crystal clear everything that's going on. So I'm finding actually that I'm more effective and I'm more engaged than I was face to face, kind of an interesting way. Um, and then the, as far as our team, we are keeping it uh, moving along and engaging by um, one way we're doing it is asking a different question at the beginning of each meeting. And um, it's just a way to kind of have an icebreaker and to keep things kind of a little bit light. And so it could be anything from what is the show that you're watching right now? What is, you know, your favorite rock band, you know, what, it, uh, what's your, your favorite um, dinner that you're door dashing in? I mean, it's just could be a variety of different questions and everyone shares. Uh, one of them was like, what's your favorite birthday cake? And one of the things we do is we celebrate birthdays. And it gave me, I wrote down every single one. So now I was able to like send the birthday cake that they love to them um, on their birthday. So it's just a fun way to stay connected. And we've been doing it uh, for like six months now. And 
I've learned more about my team than I did before. So I feel more connected in some ways. Yeah, it seems like the the importance of putting people first and becoming more of a human leader uh, is really, you know, people have talked about that for many years. And it's been one of those things where it's like, yeah, 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 I get it, I'll do it. But now, as a result of, of COVID, Black Lives Matter, everything else that's going on, leaders are really actually having to become that human uh, leader where you're putting people first and, and understanding your employees as individuals, not just as as workers. Uh, right. You know, I mean, most most leaders out there, they don't know these things about their people, what, what their favorite birthday cake is, what shows they're watching. They don't have a clue. Uh, right. I think most most people in leadership positions are mainly just worried. Hey, did you get that project done? Like, what's going on with this? You know, uh, this this big client that we have going on. Mm-hmm. So I love. I mean, do you think that's important in today's world is to really know your people? Well, one of the things that kind of gave me a testimonial to that is that we we were recruiting for a specific position and we had someone on our team that knew someone that lived not in our area and said, you know, I've been so happy since I joined this team. How is it going where you're working? And the person felt valued where they're working, but they didn't feel that same bond with the senior leadership team. And, and they actually made a move, even when they got countered on their job offer, when they found out they were leaving. And they said, No, I feel like I'm going to be seen more for who I am and valued for who I am at this new location. And so they made a career change or location, you know, job change because of it. And, and I just thought, you know, wow, that is proof that I was able to attract a top talent because we like to engage that way. And I think people do like that. I think it's uh, the choices of where you can work if it is all remote is changed dramatically. And, you know, why not go somewhere where there's a little bit of levity and fun and people enjoy each other. And, and, and also it, then when it's time to work and get the work done, because it's not all fun and games, you know, there's a lot of focus as well. Um, People stick around and they stay for a while. So it makes it easier to get things done because you understand how systems work. And so there's, there's a philosophy behind it all. And I just, it's really fascinating for me and a lot of enjoyment to see it working, to, to see the proof of it in the last few years. Yeah, and it's no longer about just dollars and cents and how much you pay people, right? I mean, uh, right, like you said, you're able to attract some top talent, not because you're paying them more, but because you're treating them like a, a human being, <laughs> which mm-hmm. is exactly, it sounds even funny to say, like, why we should even be doing that. It's like common sense, but still a lot of people struggle with it. Right. So I, I love yep. that that's uh, a kind of a focus for you guys. And I wish, honestly, more leaders around the world did that. Um, I wanted to transition a little bit to, to leading during tough times, because obviously the last year, you know, 2020 has been difficult for a lot of people, for a lot of leaders out there. Did you learn anything about leadership or about yourself um, as far as leading through difficult times like the one that we've all been in now? I think the thing that I have to keep reminding myself, um, which I, I've gone through some coaching uh, that helped me a lot before this happened, which I was really thankful for, is uh, kind of that imposter syndrome that, you have sometimes when it's like, you know, am I getting this right? Am I, am I just faking it? Um, yeah. So, but I think because of what you just mentioned that I gravitate towards kind of having that human connection, it's a little bit different than some leaders for sure. And um, I'm, I'm finding that the world, like you said, is kind of opening up to that, like, hey, this is okay. Um, I'm, I listen to some thought leaders that are sharing pretty vulnerably of what's going on with them, even with their families and how this has been a tough time. And it, it's, it's kind of helped me feel more secure and kind of my style, um, which, which has been rewarding. And, and also looking at how to do it differently every single day. I mean, I'm also leading a financial institution and we're going through, you know, a time when interest rates are lower and people are challenged, you know, possibly to pay on their loans and we've got to make sure we've got programs in place for them. And, um, you know, it's a very important job is people's money um, and help reassure them that we're going to be there for them and get them through this hard time. So uh, there's, besides all of that human connection stuff, we're doing something that um, I'm always having to look at how we can do it even better to keep people moving forward as uh, with their money and feeling confident with themselves 
so it's I I learn all the time. I'm always reading. Um, I'm always listening. I love these types of podcasts because I I feel like do I have it right? Am I getting it? Everything that was going on with um, the racial tension and Black Lives Matter. I I care so deeply about all the people I work with, and I want I didn't know what to do. Am I supposed to be doing something? And you know, I ended up calling up all of our black employees that I knew identified as black as and asked them, how are you doing? I just needed to hear from them. I, it was, it's been a challenging time and I was worried about them and, you know, asked them, what can I do to help? And, and that was something I've never done before. I've never done anything like that before. And I just trusted my gut and, you know, it was well received, which was fortunate. You mentioned uh, imposter syndrome. So I have to ask you about that because that's a, a huge topic. Did you ever go through imposter syndrome as a leader? Um, and if so, can you talk about what that felt like and what did you do to manage slash conquer it? Sure. Yeah. When I was, um, I went through the recession, like I mentioned earlier with the credit union, again, it was another tough financial time, um, different reasons. And, and we got through it. I mean, I, I'm really proud of the team and what we did to get through it. And we got to a point where things were doing really well again. And um, I was in the credit union for a long time. At that point, it was about 20 years as CEO. And and I kind of went through probably a midlife reflection where it's like, is this it? Am I doing it right? What am I, does everyone think I'm, you know, like, have I arrived? Is this it? Like, what is my purpose in life? I went through this hard time. Am I able to keep going forward? Um, am I supposed to be doing things differently? Um, what, you know, ha- am I the right leader? Like, I just, I had a lot of doubt. <laughs> I went through a lot of, um, you know, is this it with my life even? You know, is it, am I just going to retire and then I'm done and there's nothing else? Is this enough? Um, so I went through worried that if I'm even doing the job correctly. And so I, I ended up uh, doing, and I went through also a divorce at the same time and my kids were going off to college. So there was a lot of things that were going on in my life. And I ended up finding a coach, um, who I think introduced me to you, uh, Suzanne Biro. Mm -hmm. And, uh, she, I hired her as my executive coach. Um, I had never had a coach before except for early in my career. And, um, she helped me embrace who I am and see that I'm okay, that I'm, that the way I'm doing it is the right way, which means that you have to be yourself. You can't be someone else. And um, you can read books, you can do all this stuff and get ideas, but you need to come across as your own genuine self for people to believe you, to want to follow you, to, to be a leader. Um, of course, it's good if you have good habits of leadership and, you know, there's things that you're working on, but First of all, you just need to be who you are and own who you are. And it, it took me a minute to figure that out. And as soon as I started doing that, and like literally in board meetings, I would say, you know, I don't know sometimes when they ask me a question, you know, I'm struggling with that. Immediately, I was embraced by, oh, you're going to be fine. Let, let, let's give you some ideas. But like, I could see more acceptance instead of kind of a image I would always try and portray that I got it all under control. <laughs> And, um, and I worked a lot with Suzanne on that. And we ended up starting a company together, uh, a coaching company uh, that's been really exciting for me because I've learned so much that I, I said, we need to spread this word. And we started this company called Centrina Leadership that we're out there helping other executives. And it's given me even more confidence as a leader because um, we're able to take some of these ideas and help others with it. And uh, but anyway, yes, I went through that whole reflection that I think a lot of leaders go through or some do where you just don't know if you're doing it right. If you're if you're you know, you don't have a lot of people that you can go tell that you're feeling insecure when you're the leader and a CEO of a whole company. Yeah. Well, was there um, a pivotal moment for you that kind of made you realize, hey, wait a minute, like I got to take this under control or was there or even a pivotal moment that allowed you to manage or conquer it? Or was this just kind of a gradual thing that, that started to develop? I think, I think it was gradual, but it was some of those things that I just shared with you. It was, uh, 
It was kind of coming off of a really intense time and getting to a place where I wasn't in crisis. Hmm. So sometimes when you're not in crisis, you have a chance to reflect. Yeah. When you're in crisis, you're so busy working. And, you know, we've kind of been in crisis again, which I kind of thrive in that world. So yeah. <laughs> I'm really I'm really good at crisis. Um, but I, I, and when you have time to reflect, sometimes that's when the gotchas come at you. It's like, you know, you think too much. And so I started thinking a lot. And I was, you know, like I said, also going on a personal journey of being single and being a mom of older kids. There was just a lot going on. So I think when you look at all of it coming together, it's like, oh, yeah, I can see that totally happened to you. And it sounds like one of the things that really helped you was saying, I don't know. So it was, I guess, admitting, being vulnerable almost. That yeah. that helped you overcome imposter syndrome. Yes, I think that's a key part of it. I think it's okay to raise your hand and say, I need some help or I'm, I, I'm trying to figure this out and can you help me? Uh, part of the reason you know, for me as a CEO that I have a board of directors is because they all have outside viewpoints looking in. And I've been, you know, trying to tap into that and say, look, I don't have all the answers. You're, you're the one I can present an idea, but let's get some input from you as well, because you're seeing things from a different viewpoint. And, um, and then you work more collaboratively. And the same thing with your team. You know, I, this whole process of being more inclusive and creating that sense of belonging in an organization. Um, we're, we're going through that as a, a team together. We created a diversity, inclusion, and belonging team that's cross-functional with employees from uh, all different um, parts of the organization and not just management. And our first call, I was there along with them, and we all had this activity that one of our human resource team members brought forward and it was to be vulnerable and people were emotional and sharing at a really deep level. And I was the same way with them. And, and we all walked away so bonded at the end because we went through something together and they were like, wow, I was worried about, you know, you being here as CEO, but it was so powerful for us to go through this together. And now we can take this feeling that we just created and try and create the whole organization. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I'm finding so much joy in that. So it, you don't have to, always wave your CEO flag. You can just be a human and show up and be vulnerable with people. Yeah, no, I love that. Um, so I wanted to ask you about this just because I don't I don't talk to a lot of female CEOs uh, because there's, honestly, there's not many female CEOs out there and I get a lot of requests from people who listen to the show and they always say, hey, Jacob, you gotta have more diverse guests. And people need to understand it's not for lack of trying. They're, you know, just to give people context, on the Fortune 500 list, I think seven or eight percent of all the CEOs are female. So there are not a lot of female um, senior executives out there like yourself. So I wanted to get your perspective on being a female CEO because I do have a lot of uh, female listeners, and they really want to understand: is uh, you know, what is it like being a female leader? Have there been any challenges that you've had to overcome, or what, what has it been like for you? Um, you know, I've been asked this before, and I have been just always comfortable in some sense of showing up as who I am. So I'm not traditional. I don't walk into rooms. I, I don't play golf, although I want to play golf. But um, a lot of times I would see clicks, I call them clicks, of people uh, that hang out together on the golf course, and then they come in and um, you know, from a room of CEOs, there might be a connection that a group has because they, they're they similar and I'm, I'm a little bit different. But I've broken through those over the years by just kind of walking over and being myself and just being part of the conversation and, um, and sharing my ideas uh, in a room full of people and not, I think, being young when I first got into the role helped because I see a lot of younger people being really bold in their voice and a lot of women and, and men. And I think it's important just to embrace who you are and not be afraid. And I was that kind of person in my twenties. I, I was 28, I was 30 years old when I became CEO and I didn't have um, a lot of fear and I would just, and I think part of it was the beginning of my career going into the boardroom as, you know, from 22 to 28 years old, I would walk into the boardroom and be the auditor that showed up to deliver some kind of news, whether it was good news or bad news. And I had a lot of 
men board members sitting around the table that were like 40 years older than me and they had to listen to me. And so I learned how to ha have that conversation. And, and I learned that there was a lot of respect given to me because I had something to say that they would listen to and they were kind of forced to listen to me, but I also proved that I could deliver it well. And so that kind of uh, skill that I learned early um, helped me throughout my career that, um, that you might have differences, but you can also have your own voice and you can show up and, and don't be intimidated, don't apologize for it. I mean, we're just different. Some women are different than men and you don't need to say you're sorry for it. So for uh, female executives who are out there or f uh, females who want to become uh, leaders or executives, is there any specific piece of advice that you would give them? Um, for example, if you could go and see the, uh, the younger, the younger Carrie and, and travel back in time, is there any advice that you would give yourself that maybe you, you didn't know or weren't practicing at the time? I think it would be to, you know, show up when you're in the, op when you have an opportunity to be seen and heard, to show up with confidence and professionalism, be prepared, you know, don't apologize, um, be bold um, and, and listen and ask others what their opinions are, but don't be afraid to share your own and, um, I think I think the world's ready for you yeah. is what I would say. <laughs> and there's a, there's a lot of acceptance being recognized for diversity. Yeah. And so it's it's finding that right audience that's listening to you. Don't carry a chip on your shoulder. Um, be inquisitive. Be curious. Um, be kind. You know. And at the same time, you know, be be bold. Yeah. No, I love that advice. I think the boldness is is crucial. Uh, well, we only have a couple minutes left, so maybe just one or two more questions for you. Um, first one is, is there a specific moment or experience that most impacted your approach to being a leader? So just like a specific instance or scenario that happened. I can think of one that influenced me early on, and that was I was auditing a credit union, and it was a very large place. And... It happened to be Valentine's Day, and the CEO was walking around giving every single employee, male and female, a red rose, and every everyone, every cubicle, every branch, every teller, and he made a point of coming over and giving me one and saying, thank you for being here, and I just thought it was the classiest thing. I was like, it really influenced me that Here's a leader that could easily have not done that. And he made such a big impact with a very kind gesture. And everyone loved this person. And he ran a very, very well-run credit union where everyone wanted to work for him and do a good job for him. And that. so that was a really influential moment for me. So recognizing and seeing everybody regardless of, of who you are or what you're doing, uh, which I think mm -hmm. is one of the biggest mistakes and the greatest opportunities for leaders is just recognizing your people and saying, I appreciate the work that you're doing. How are you? Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. It's such an easy thing and something that so many people forget to do. Uh, maybe the very, very last question for you is, are there any common pitfalls or mistakes that you see leaders making? And this could be new leaders or, or seasoned leaders. I think you might have just said it. I think it's being caught up in the business that you have and solving the problems for the business and not really paying attention with a lot of thoughtful design processes around making sure the people that work for you feel valued. Mm. Um, it's To me, it, you said it's an easy thing to do, but it actually is kind of hard and it takes time. Um, being really thoughtful, having a, a strong culture where people feel recognized and valued, there's a lot of work that goes into it yeah. and it's not easy. It actually, that's what we call as a key success factor. It's not easily replicated. Yep. But I think if, if leaders can, um, if, if it's not natural for them, make sure you have people where it is and then also be natural when it is natural for you. You know, be vulnerable at times in front of your employees. Um, you know, send out an all email and just t talk a little about who you are and invite people to share a little about who they are. 
I, it goes so far, like you said. Yeah. I think people really crave that, especially in this remote world. Oh, yeah. Couldn't agree more. Um, well, to wrap up, I just had a couple like really rapid fire questions, just fun, fun questions so that people can get to learn a little bit more about you. Um, starting off with what is a book that you recommend could be business book or non business book? Oh, um, let's see. I like to read for fiction, so I don't read a lot of like management books, but of course I'm going to recommend your book, The Future of Leadership. <laughs> the Future Le- too, but, There we go. Uh, no, the, yeah, that's a great book. Um, I have one here. I haven't read it yet, but it's, uh, it's listed here. It's How Not to Die, and it's uh, about <laughs> you know, staying healthy. <laughs> All right. Okay. I don't so, die yet. <laughs> the, the future leader and how not to die. Those are your book recommendations, everyone. Uh, yes. I love that. Um, if you were doing a different career, what do you think you would have ended up doing? Oh, when I first moved to Santa Cruz and I didn't have a job, and my dad said I was committing career suicide because I was quitting my CPA firm, I said, Don't worry, dad, I'm going to stand on the beach and I'm going to be like the Mrs. Fields of Santa Cruz and I'm going to have fresh bait cookies for the surfers coming out of the ocean <laughs> so oh, man. i have no idea what i would have done but that was like my vision cookies i like it uh, what has been <laughs> your greatest business failure oh um now you're gonna make me really vulnerable uh my greatest business failure or uh your most embarrassing moment <laughs> Okay, I'm embarrassed by this one. Even saying it makes me turn red. But I had just had, uh, I think it was my second child, and I was, you know, kind of postpartum, and I went into one of my branches, and I looked disheveled, and I went over to an employee and said, uh, I tried to, like, pull myself together. Here I am, the CEO of an organization, and I did take full maternity leave, and I've been able to do that when I was CEO. But um I, I walked over to an employee and said, hi, I'm Carrie, I'm the CEO, but I'm on leave. I just wanted to you know, welcome you and say hi. And the employee looked at me and said, Carrie, I've worked for you for five years. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, man. I almost died. And she had changed the color of her hair and done a few things, but it was still like, so embarrassing i wanted to just i wanted to be like fred flintstone and grow to one inch tall (laughs) oh man that is awesome okay i like that story that's a good one um all right next one for you is what are you most proud of i am most proud of you know i've i've not only my career but most importantly is being a mom of three amazing kids i have been a single mom for about 10 years of it and um, they all are blossoming and doing great as young adults and to graduate college and have jobs. And I just, I feel so much pride towards my kids. So I've tried to really balance being a female leader and also being a good mom. And I feel like I'm, I'm doing it as much as I can every day as a trying to balance it all. But, uh, I'm very proud of my children. I like that. Yeah. I mean, life is hard, right? I mean, it's, it's tough yeah. out there. So people need to give themselves a break. Everybody should give uh, give themselves a little bit of slack. Nobody's got everything figured out. Nobody's got all nope. the answers. We're all kind of, uh, you know, in, in the journey together. So people need yeah, to... Yeah, when I, uh, very, real quick, really early on, I when I was, I had young kids, I hired with other moms um, a coach to help us with parenting. And one of the things that I learned about myself, she said, you need to think of your workday as a balloon. And so if you're holding a balloon and you push on one side, the other side kind of grows a little bit bigger. And if you push on the other side, and that's how your day is. So every day when you wake up, think about how yesterday went. And if you feel like you gave more to your work than your children, then today give more to your children than your work. And you just need to every day rebalance. And so I gave myself the grace and uh, ability to maybe not be the best employee that day, but be a really good mom that day. And then mm. the next day it was like rebalancing again. So that was really good advice for me. I love that. That is a fantastic analogy and a wonderful way, I think, to wrap up this episode. Uh, so Carrie, where can people go to learn more about you, uh, the Federal Credit Union? I mean, anything that you want to share for people to check out, please feel free to do so. Yeah, you could definitely check me out at um, bayfed.com. There's an executive section and my profile's there. And also 
uh, the business I started with coaching and leadership, centrinaleadership.com. So I could get you the spelling of those, but it's uh, those are the two places you can find me. Perfect. Well, Carrie, thank you so much for taking time out of your day. This has been awesome. And hopefully we'll get a chance to get together in person one of these days since you're... Uh, That'd be great. I'm in the Bay Area, you're in the Bay Area, and I haven't been down to Santa Cruz in a while after uh, after college. So maybe one of these well, days we'll I'll, make a trip. And I'll take you on my walk and show you my spot. <laughs> that would be awesome. Well, again, oh, thank you. And people can find me on Instagram too, Carrie Burkhofer on Instagram. And I show pictures of where I go every day. So. Oh, all right. I'm going to have to add you on Instagram too. Well, again, thank you, Perfect. Carrie, so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Appreciate my, it. My pleasure. And thanks again, everyone, for tuning in. My guest has been Carrie Burkhofer, the president and CEO at Bay Federal Credit Union. Please make sure to check her out and connect with her. You won't regret that you did. See you next time. <laughs> thank you. Thanks again for tuning into the Future of Work with Jacob Morgan. I hope you enjoyed the show. Please remember to follow me on Spotify, subscribe on Apple Podcasts or your favorite platform at futureofworkpodcast.com. And also, don't forget to check out my brand new podcast on entrepreneurship with my wife, Blake, at byobpodcast.com. If you want to reach out to me about sponsoring the show or if you just have feedback for me, please send me an email jacob at thefutureorganization.com. And of course, I would love a review or a rating on Apple Podcasts or whatever your preferred channel is. 